we're in a series talking about relationships. I'm going to go a little further this morning, but God has a purpose for relationships. He, he uses them uniquely to shape you and help you to become the person he's created you to be. How many of you have ever had somebody divinely come into your life for the good? Now we, we can score, we got a score list of all the guys who came into our life and gals who came into our life that left us in wreckage and threw us out the car door while they were driving and uh, left us in a mess. But how many of you know there are moments, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, there, there would be moments where God sends somebody into your relationship and it, it changed everything. For you, you, you begin to trust a little more, begin to hope a little more, and, and all of a sudden God uses them to help you get out of the hole that you're in. How, how many of you would say you, you remember a moment, and it, it, sometimes it's grandma, sometimes it's somebody, but how many of you remember a moment somebody walked in your life in the most difficult time and God used them? How, how many of you know that? Have you had that experience? Yeah, God, God uses people. He, he loves people, uh, but he wants somebody with skin on to come give you a hug when, when he's in heaven waiting to hug you when you get there, but he wants to use his family to come around you. We, we need relationships, but if we're not careful, we live in a world that says you don't, right? You know, just, you know, keep everybody at arm's length, don't get too close, and whatever you do, don't share your feelings, Right? If I lay my feelings out there, oh no, it's going on YouTube and then it'll go viral and then it's all whack. You know, it's crazy. When we talk about relationships, it's really weird. If, if you go online or if you go to Instagram, if you go to a Christian Mingle website, uh, you go to Facebook, there, there's what's happening now is what they call pseudo-relationships. That simply means that I have a relationship through this electronic device, but the truth is, is I'm kind of letting you see the good side of me. Amen? You know, when I throw a pickup, uh, you know, a pickup, I, didn't, I shouldn't say it like that, when I throw a pick, see, I'm not a techie guy, I'm already in trouble, I'm already in trouble. When I throw a picture, let's say picture, up on the web, I don't throw an ugly one up there. I might even soften up the eyes a little bit, you know, you know, shrink some pounds. From, the kids tell me they can make me look good because I, apparently I don't look good. That's why they said, Pastor, we could make you look good. And we could throw a picture where you're this skinny, handsome guy. And, and I thought to myself, you know, you go on to mingle.com or one of those things. And I'm sure nobody says, listen, I'm broken. I've got emotional issues. I need you to come save me. Nobody says that. Nobody says that. They, they go on and they paint a picture of who they are. And they're wanting to engage in relationship with somebody. And I, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this either the week after, either next week or the week after that. But I'm going to talk about there's this gap between the relationship of my expectations from the, the person I'm friending or my spouse, there's this gap from what I expect from them and what I actually get. How many of you know that's true? Amen. The question is, what do you do with that gap? What is the gap with? Well, I expected him to come home, do the dishes and the laundry, make the bed, give me a kiss, and, you know, sing a lullaby to me as we go to bed at night. He comes home, and that's the expectation, and he crashes and burns. Amen. Every night. And then he has the expectations, and sometimes it's the exact same ones. I'm going to come home, sit down. She's going to bring my food, food to me while I'm sitting there on the couch gaming on my gaming device, eating with one hand, gaming with the other, and she's going to carry me to bed and sing me a lullaby. And there's this gap between what is in my box, and we'll talk about this later, but I have this box, of it, box, and in it is expectations, and I come to a relationship, and if I'm not careful, I'm expecting, in my case, my lovely wife, Lisa, to take care of all these expectations. She needs to come and save me. All of my futures are riding on that, her responding to my expectations. And that's where the rub happens, doesn't it, in relationships. It's true with friends. 
not just marriages or relationships that are romantic, but it's true of every relationship. When I come to the relationship, I have a certain expectation. And if I'm not careful, if you're not meeting that expectation, then I just cut you off. And so when we look at relationships today, uh, we've been asking ourselves a question in this series, God's purpose for relationships. And one of the purposes is to teach you how to love. One of God's purposes for relationship is to teach you about love, how to love, and also how to receive love. You know, you, you just can't experience that or get your arms around that unless you're in relationship relationships are required they are if they were weren't god would have just said hey adam i've created you instead of saying this isn't good he needs a helpmate instead you know he would have just said i'm just gonna let him go at his own i'm not gonna make eve he can just handle it all by himself but god requires relationships so much so that he made it crystal clear as to how you and i are to navigate relationships now this morning we're going to look at, uh, start to look at the first, the four laws required in a marriage. Now marriages today are falling in love is easy to, it's easy to fall in love today and it's easy to get married, but it's really, really hard to stay there. Amen. Relationships just kind of go south pretty quickly, but and here's the point. And here's what's important this morning. God didn't create you and I to have relationships so they would fail. He didn't. He did not create you and I and say relationships are, quiet, are required. And then turn around and look at you and say, hey man, you're on your own. Figure it out. There's no boundaries. There's no laws. There's no rules to navigate relationships. There are four laws that we're going to start talking about this morning. We're going to look at the first two of them. And if you navigate relationships in this maintaining a respect and an honor for God's rules, God's laws for relationships, it will work. It will absolutely work. We said, you know, uh, the average relationship or marriage in the world we live in today was, it has a 50-50% chance of success. And what has happened in this next generation is they've decided marriage is not really that important. I don't know that I want to move into that. I don't think it's necessary. Here's their perspective. Their perspective is I've got a 50-50 chance that this is going to work. I'm going to end up an emotional wreck and they're going to end up an emotional wreck and it's going to be a mess. And when it's all over with, we're going to lose a whole lot of money getting divorced. So why would we get married? And the sad problem or the sad fact about that perspective from this next generation is they don't see anybody modeling marriage very well. And secondly, they don't know the four laws that I'm going to tell you about right now. God says, you want to improve those odds? You want a 100% chance of a love for a lifetime, a friendship for a lifetime? Then there has to be, you have to live according to these laws. Now, if you... Again, go, you go to Southwest, and you go online, and you order a ticket between here and Texas, and it says, hey, by the way, you have a 50% chance of making it. It's going to be great. It's going to be the, the thrill of a lifetime. She's going, no, I'm flying in an old plane with 50% chance. I'm out. You see, we, we want to get on that plane. We want 100% uh, perspective that this is going to work. And it will if the plane has been taken care of, if they live according to the law of dynamics and they understand gravity and they understand how the plane is made, if they live within the boundaries of those laws, we'll make it to Texas. And so it is this morning that we're going to look at God's laws about relationships. And why this is so important is that it goes, it bridges every relationship. It has to do with my relationship with the Lord, has to do with my relationship with my wife, with my kids, with my friends. I need to navigate relationships with these laws in place. Now, here's what God does. God says, I'm going to illustrate these laws in a marriage relationship between Adam and Eve. So right out of the gate, God says, I'm going to give you the laws for, for relationships that will be successful. Jesus would later quote the passage we're going to read in the New Testament. Now, these laws have to do with 
husband and wife relationships, but it's also true that these laws work in my relationship with the Lord. And they'll also work with friends um, that the Lord has brought into our sphere of influence to love. Because God has called you, think about this, God has called you to love one another. Christ said, love one another as you have seen me love people. That's a monumental statement. I mean, he went and grabbed the guy who's demon-possessed and cast demons out of him. You know, if I see a guy on the corner, he's demon-possessed, I'm going to the other corner. I'm driving the other way. I want to give him a hug, and I, I want to run, right? There's people that, that, you know, are broken down and hurt, and you're going, man, I am, do not feel like Dr. Phil today. I do not want to hear this. I, mean, I, I just don't want to. God says, go over there and love them. Jesus loved uniquely. Now, you think about the, the disciples. I mean, they were a train wreck. I mean, they were young guys. They probably cussed like sailors. They were on a boat. They were fishermen. I mean, there's one day he's going, Peter, you're awesome. Next day he looks at Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. Man, why do you say stuff like that? You're wearing me out, kid. And then he turns around and Peter denies him three times as he's head towards the cross. I mean, you know, somebody ditches us three times. We're cutting them off. Relationship's over. I'm going to go find me a new friend. So, so God challenges you and I to do relationships at a whole nother level. He asks you to love one another as I've loved you. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your might, with all your soul. And, and the second commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. Within all of that is relationship. So let's look at the guidelines that, that God mentions in relationships. And it's in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, and you can follow along with me. Within this verse are four laws that are required for relationships to do well. And I, I want to walk through them, and I'll break it out for you. But let's look at verse 2, and ver, or excuse me, Genesis chapter 2, and look at verse 24. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, so he's, he's talking, it, Adam and Eve have been created, and he's, he's saying to them, so listen. Uh, now listen to the language of this earth. For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother. He's talking to Adam and Eve. Now Adam and Eve doesn't have a father and a mother, right? God created them. So this verse is not just for them. He's saying, listen, as you have kids, here's what's going to happen in the generations to come. I'm going to give you the, the way to do relationships in the future. You're going to have to teach it to your kids. And here's one of, one of the principles. He says, the second principle as, goes on to say, he says, you will leave your father and mother and be joined to his wife. So he will leave them. He will join his wife. And they shall become one flesh. Principle number three. And the Man and his wife were both naked, were not ashamed. I know one, one translation says, uh, For this reason man shall leave his father and his mother, and he shall cleave to his wife. Cleave sounds like cleaver, so I don't like that word. It just sounds kind of, sounds like most marriages, right? A cleaver, knife in the marriage. It's just not, you put anger. They tell you never to have a fight in the kitchen. There's a lot of marriages that have fights in the kitchen. There's knives around. People get hurt in the kitchen. So always go to another place just uh, giving you that one for free. Amen? So here's the four laws. Law number one is the law of priority. The law of priority says if you want a marriage for a lifetime, a relationship for a lifetime, then here's what has to happen. And it says in the very first portion of the verse, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. Here's what has to happen. There has to be a moment where I have to leave mom and dad and my wife has to become the number one priority in my life. Absolutely the number one. Have you ever uh, been involved in a relationship or you've seen from the sidelines where there's one person in a relationship, every time they fight, they run home to mom? Yeah, yeah that's not good. That's not good. You, you try to live inside your own mom and dad's house, that can be dangerous. I know of relationships that I've counseled and the man and wife will go to the in-law's house and as soon as they walk through the door, the sibling of that particular parent slips back into kid mode. And all of a sudden, their spouse, let's say their husband, is not the number one priority and now it's mom and dad are the number one priority. And how many of you know that will hurt your feelings? You won't want to go see the in-laws. They call them monster-in-laws at that point. It gets ugly. 
And so in that moment, it, it's so important that they become number one. Did, do you know that when you start dating the one that you love, they're number one? You know, all your friends go, dude, you must have a girlfriend. What do you say that for? Because I haven't seen you in three weeks. You know, we usually go to Buffalo Wings, watch a football game. I ain't seen you for like three weeks. So who is she? What's up? You see, and in that moment, we have literally left everybody else and said, hey, mama, you're number one. And, and we do that. We do that with our time. We do that with our talents. We do that with our treasures. And so in the dating season, when we're dating and we're going out, we, we've made them number one. We've gotten in trouble with mom and dad because we spent too much time with them and we were supposed to come home on time. Amen? But what happens many times is when we get into the marriage, all of a sudden, if we don't maintain our spouse as number one, then it stall, starts to fall apart. And typically what happens is in a couple of years, you have kids. And then you have these kids, and then all of a sudden, the husband starts making his job priority number one, and the wife it makes the, raising the kids priority number one, and then all of a sudden, there's no date night. You see, I absolutely believe in, in date night. And that's a moment where you say, kids, I, I love you, and business, you have to hold off, but I've calendared in my, my schedule that every night this particular week is date night with mama. She's number one. And you know, when you walk out the door, the kids will even look at you. And I remember one of my kids looking at me, he's like, oh, you love mama more than you love me. And I mean, they, they poured it on, man. It's like, please let me go, let me go. And here's what I know. Here's what I absolutely know. The greatest security that you can bring to a child is that you tell them, I love your mama more than anybody else. She's number one in my life. Not, not more than God. God's number one, but mama's number two. And, and there's nothing greater you can do to in the inside of a child to bring security and peace and I have a loving home than to say, my dad goes out with my mom. He still takes her on a date. And it's the most amazing thing. It, it really works. They're fussing all the way as you go to the door, but when you come back. Now, you know what the most insecure thing you can do to a child, right? then that's to get involved in a divorce or a, a, a relationship that's separating and falling apart. It will crumble down every wall, every emotional fabric within their being will begin to fray and fall apart because mom and dad are falling apart or the, a divorce has happened. It's the most insecure season of the life of a child. But, but listen, you're supposed to go into a relationship if you want to love for a lifetime, and we're going to use that model, and I'll tell you why. Because God said that, that Jesus is described in the Bible, he is the groom and you are the bride. In the same way, Jesus has loved you and made all of us his number one. My, my mom tells every one of us four boys we're her favorite. That doesn't make sense, right? Uh, thinking wise, but don't try to figure out, it just works. My, every one of my brothers are pastors and they go to their church and they say, hey, you know, my mom thinks I'm number one. I walk right up on stage when I'm preaching. And I said, you know, I love my little brother, but he's deceived. I'm number one. Uh, my mom and dad love me more than they love him. And we have this funny little fight going on. But, but here's the deal. You're number one. Jesus said, I love you so much. You're my first priority. Before I get a home to camp out, before I set up a kingdom here on earth and be a ruler, I'm going to keep loving my bride in the direction I want her to go. She's number one to me. And that would be all of us. So, so the number one priority, or the law, is the law of priority. If you want a relationship to fall apart, then just immediately I will tell you, if it's falling apart, you have not made them number one. You know, I love you, you're awesome, but, you know, I've, I haven't spent a couple hours with you all this week. I haven't taken you to dinner. I have, and, you know, life's crazy, right? I mean, there's, you know, you're going to go on date night and the water heater is going to explode and you can't go nowhere, Right? So I get that that's going to happen. But there has to be a sense that my wife is saying, honey, we can go out tonight. We can still have dinner and not have a shower tomorrow morning because <laughs> the water heater's out. Or we could do the hot water heater. What do you want to do? And, and you have to make it priority number one. 
Now, now this would be the challenge. He's talking to Adam and Eve. He goes, now listen, you're going to have these kids. They're going to be amazing. And you're going to want them to just stay with you the rest of your life. And better yet, uh, they actually, they'll start eating you out of house and home. They'll drive you crazy. And then you'll want to, you know, nudge them to move out. You love the eaglet, but you want him out of the nest. Amen. And I hope he flies before he hits the ground. And you, you, you push him off. But, but then is, if you're not careful, hey, you know, that, that, that lady you married, uh, you know, don't listen to her more than me. I'm your dad. You're supposed to listen to me. And there's this thing. God makes it real, real clear. No, when your kids grow up, they're going to move away, and she is going to be your son's number one priority. If you violate this law, it will fall apart on you. When we go, when we get into kids being in the season of junior high and high school where they're all going around playing games, and you become a taxi driver, how many of you have been in that zone before? That's another season where it's terrible for you to have, make your spouse number one. You're distracted, they become one, and life begins to get in the way. So not, law number one is your, your spouse has to be the top priority. You have to make them number one. And that says in this verse, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife. Now that, that second part is uh, it, it says to, we're to cleave. Uh, one version says to cleave. And law number two is the law of pursuit. Did you know that there needs to be energy put forward in a relationship in order for it to sustain itself? So here's what we're getting at is these laws will help you experience love and learn to love, and you will experience the feelings of love when you live within the boundaries of these laws. I promise you, if you will go home and you'll begin to date your wife, I, I don't care if you think you've fallen out of love. I don't care if the feelings of love have left. He, here's what I know, that if you will live within these boundaries, the feelings of love will come back as you begin to live these out. Now you're saying, Pastor, you don't understand who I'm married to. And they, and they may not reciprocate. And I get all that. I, I know the potential for them not to reciprocate is absolutely true. But if you will live by the laws, God will honor you and help you. And he will bid them to move back. Here's what I know. It's very difficult to have the feelings of love from a wife that you've married to that's like Mother Teresa and just keep walking on her. It's just really hard to do that. Now, you might do it for a season of time, but there comes a point where it's like, man, she deserves somebody better than me, or I better suck it up and change. I need to love her like she's loving me. You see, the, to the degree that I feel loved or not loved, to that same degree, it encourages me to behave better in relationship or, re, or, or begin to behave worse in relationship. And so I'm going to give you a thermometer this morning. As we look at law number two, the law of pursuit, do you pursue in relationship? Do you pursue them? Do you put energy into the relationship? And here's the question that will measure that. When you're in a relationship with someone you love, you're trying to stay in love, maintain the feelings of love, have a relationship for a love for a lifetime. If you're going to do that, here's one thing that has to happen. And I'm going to ask you a question, and you answer it in, in your own heart. But when you think of them and what they've done for you, or you're coming home, do you always assume in their behavior, do you assume the worst, or do you assume the best? Pastor, you don't understand. They have, I don't, you know what? How many times I've asked them to clean the house before I come home, and that never happens. I've given up. I assume the worst. When I walk in, you know what happens when you walk in and you assume the worst? I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. That's your language. I knew it. You, I knew you weren't, you know, this is another day I can put on my calendar where you didn't clean the house before I got home, and now I got to sit here in this mess. You see, my expectation in the relationship is being met by you Hey, but here's what I know. Here's what I know. People rise to the level of your expectation. They rise to the level of your expectation. You know, no kid just rises to be this great, wonderful man that loves his wife. When everybody, if, if mom and dad comes in every day and says, you'll never make it, you're worthless. You know how hard that is to break through that emotional beating up over and over again? 
You see, if, if, if I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm, I want my kids to, uh, to rise to the level of my encouragement, what would that look like? When's the last time you encouraged them? See, see uh, it, it's, it, you have to ask yourself, if I naturally come in and I expect the worst, then your language, your tone, everything you have just said is probably what they'll live up to. You walk in and go, I knew you wouldn't do what I told you. I gave you that list, and you did all nine, and you left the tenth one out. What, what kind of person are you? I knew you would fail. Guess what happens the next time you give them a list of ten items? They're going to go, well, the bar's about this high. She expects me or he expects me to fail miserably. So why even try? Why even try? What if... The expectation is to come in and say, man, you're number one. You did nine of these things. I didn't even think there was enough hours. I just gave you a list of 10. I thought maybe you would get five done because I know you're a busy wife and you're raising kids and doing all this. You're awesome. Guess what happens? The next list of 10 gets better and better and better. You see, but here's the problem. The problem is, is I'm not going in the relationship to give. I'm going into the relationship to get. And that's where the problem is. Jesus messes up everything when he comes in and says, love other people like I love you. You go in, and when we get to, to Ephesians, Ephesians is, chapter 5 is all about relationships. And there's this word called mutual submission. It's like both of us are fighting and racing to get to the end of the line so the other one can be in the front of the line. It's like, honey, where would you like to go? Well, I want to go wherever you want to go. No, I want to go wherever. No, you deserve it. You're much prettier. And, and you know, and I'm just, you know, I'm just lucky to be married to you. No, we're going to where you want to go. That's what mutual submission looks like. And you you live in that kind of environment and it just works. But you go, somebody's got to win. It's got to go somebody's way. But when you live in an environment, a relational environment like that, what happens is that you find yourself both giving. And, and, okay, I'll do it this time, but next time we're going wherever you want to go. Next time we're going to do this. And one of the things we used to do in our family is on date night, one day night, I'm in charge. I get to decide what we eat and, you know, which football game we watch together. Amen, because I know she loves football. Woo! Okay. And then, you know, the next time she's going to pick the food and we're going to watch some love story, probably Hallmark. I'm going to try to stay enthused. I kind of know what's going to happen. We're going to make it through the snow for Christmas. We're going to get there. We're going to have the big kiss, and everybody gets their presents. I already know the whole thing, and i got to be excited. Amen. Nobody gets killed. There's no bombs. There's nothing in this movie, but I struggle for the sake of the gospel to be the husband I'm supposed to be. Amen. But you know what we've done in that situation? What we've said is, I value you. You're my number one priority. It's important to me that on at least most of the date nights that, that we do it your way. We would do the same thing on our family nights. Every one of the kids would get to pick what we were going to eat, what game we were going to play for family night. Tonight's their night. Oh, I don't want to. You know, one person always wanted mac and cheese. How many of you know, I like mac and cheese, but you can get old, amen, after a while. You just want something with meat, amen. But it was their night. And you know what it forces you to do? Here it is, you got to sacrifice. You have to sacrifice. Love can only be experienced by sacrifice. And to the degree or the level of sacrifice will determine how much love you experience. You know, when I, I go buy a card at 7-Eleven the night before Valentine's Day, <laughs> and you know they don't have very good cards there so you're just really you're, you're hating it and then you show up or it's early valentine's morning and i give it to her and it doesn't say very good stuff because they didn't have a very big selection i give it her and she goes oh <laughs> that's nice <laughs> he loves me what a nice valentine's card there's not much sacrifice put in that gift but if i sit down and I make something for her for Valentine's. And I put 20 hours into it. And I write my own Valentine's card. And I give it to her. The craft may be, that I put together may be ugly. She may not even like it. My words, I am not a poet. And I do know it. Amen. 
this is not my gift mix, but I'm going to give it to her anyways. And she's going to look through it like, boy, if he could have just went online, he could have got some better words that rhyme, amen? But, but, but the sacrifice, the sacrifice in this letter and all his energy, he's pursuing me. He's pursuing me. I'm, he's living according to the law of I'm a priority to him. And there's energy, there's a pursuit that will cleave. In the Bible, that word says to hold on to, to keep chasing after and to hold on to her. D does that describe you? E even in a friendship relationship, how many of you know you can be in a friendship relationship and they're going through a dark season and all of a sudden they slip away? Do you pursue them? Right? I mean, there's this level of, I pursue them at the speed they want me to. I can't overwhelm them. I get that. But if you just let them go and never pursue, how will they know you really care? Right? You see, see relationships, that God says, are required. And, and you and I move in and out of, I'm loving sacrificially to somebody else. And then it switches, and I'm receiving love, and they're being sacrificial to me. And... I can't hardly stay in this relationship without doing something more because she's been sacrificing, sacrificing, sacrificing. And God says, this will work. This will work. I have seen marriages that literally said, Pastor, we are no longer in love. The, the feelings of love are gone. How, how many of you know you have to be careful with feelings, right? Because feelings will lie to you, right? Feelings will tell you, Get rid of her. Amen. <laughs> I've been married to her for 20 years. I'm just going to take her to her mom and dad's and blah, blah, blah. And in that moment, I'm just mad. And a lot of times I'm mad because I did something stupid. She's mad at me. And I'm tired. I don't want to sacrifice. And selfishness starts creeping up. I just want somebody who's just going to let me do whatever I want to do. Hey, uh, you know, hello, I hate to spoil the whole wagon train thing. There's nobody out there that's going to let you do everything you want to do in the relationship. They're going to leave you too. you you, you got to give. Relationships only work when both are giving. It's called mutual submission. Giving to the relationship. And you know what? If you give, they will change. I, I've seen moments where a husband once said, listen, I'm a train wreck. Uh, I'm full of insecurities. I'm fearful about my career, about being a good husband. I'm fearful about being a parent. I've, I've, I've chased after work, and I want to supply all the money for the family. And honestly, I'm, I'm so worried about failing in my career that I've, I've let you go. You haven't been a priority, and I haven't pursued you. And my kids haven't felt that they're a priority to, to me. I missed all their games. I let you go by yourself. And I need you all to forgive me. And from this day forward, we're going to make less money. And mama, you're going to be a priority. Kids, I need you to forgive me. And I'm going to start being at more of your games. I'm going to be more involved in your life. And this is what we're going to do. And we're going to talk about God. We're going to talk about relationships. And God's going to help me to be the dad that you need me to be. And we're going to talk about what I should have done over the last couple of years. And what I'm going to do from this day forward. And I've watched a family that literally is separated. Move back into the same home. And now the feeling of love. The feelings of love have been restored. Because these laws absolutely work. I, I promise you they work. You say, Pastor, listen. The last guy left me. I'm a mess. The last girl left me. I'm a mess. Uh, if I'm absolutely honest, I don't think I have the ability to, to trust anybody else with my emotions. And, and God will tell you, well, you'll get to a spot where you're so lonely, that'll change. Because I didn't wire you to be lonely. I didn't wire you. I didn't create you. How, how crazy would it be if God said, I've given you a need inside for companionship. And there are a few people in the world that God has called to be single their whole life. And that's a unique group. And, and, God, uh, and in, in reality, they may be single in the sense of not getting made, married here on earth, but they have a, a, a love relationship with God that is, he's the groom and they're the spouse and, and it's a love relationship to do his work. And the same principles are going on in their relationship with God. But if that's you, how tragic would it be if he said, hey, you know, go jump in this plane and take off, but there's no rules, there's no laws you have to obey. Just, you know, wing it. 
No, God says, I've given you some laws and they will help you. So, so listen, he wants you to, here it is, succeed at relationships. But, but you can get in your own way. And, and here's what I absolutely know. I can put my wife first. I can put my kids first. Uh, and I can pursue them with energy, not just I'm going to sit around and watch the football game with them and tell them to be quiet through the whole experience, right? That's not pursuing my kids. That's sitting down watching The Lion King 18 million times. Amen. I can sing all the songs with them in Jesus' name. Amen. Because they're important to me. You, you see, the feelings of love come from and are birthed from sacrificial loving behavior. If you love sacrificially, even somebody who's absolutely selfish and stuck on themselves, if you change in a relationship, they will change. And here's what will happen. You can love somebody so well that they will either change or they will run away from you because they just can't stand you. Because every time I get with you, you love me sacrificially. I'm not doing it back to you. I feel guilty with I'm, when I'm with you. And it drives me so crazy that I'm either going to divorce you and run away because I'm tired of you being so nice and me not being nice. Or it's going to compel me to go, would you forgive me? I got to do this all over again. But the relationship will change if you change. But hey, here's a question this morning. Do, do you do relationships that way? Do you stay within the boundaries of the law of priority? and the law of pursuit. God said this will work. This will absolutely work. And we have to we have to move in that direction. Would you bow your heads this morning? If you enjoyed the message today and you want to partner with us to reach others for Christ, click the link down below to give now.